Cheers to you. And let us begin. So, uh, I kind of missed this uh, yesterday until like later in the day that um, Bernie Sanders had endorsed Joe Biden. And um, I had a feeling, uh, you know, if we if we didn't see it now, if we didn't see it, um, you know, because he suspended his campaign, what, 10 days ago, maybe? Um, I can't, I can't remember the exact time that he suspended his campaign, but it wasn't that long ago. And I basically said within a week, uh, two weeks, he would endorse Joe Biden. And if he doesn't do it within that time frame, he'd do it at the convention. That was sort of, um, the, uh, the thought process that I had. And here we are two weeks later, he endorses Joe Biden. Now, um, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Kelly Lane, had pointed out that uh, they all signed, um, you know, this piece of document that basically said whoever ends up being the uh, DNC nominee, um, that all of the all all of the people running for president were going to uh, endorse them. The only one that didn't endorse Joe Biden uh, was Marianne Williamson. And I don't really give a shit about what you think about Marianne Williamson. I, um, my the, the fact remains that she is the only one that didn't tow the establishment line. Uh, that she basically was just like, no, fuck this contract. This contract is bullshit. If she even signed the contract, I'm not sure if she did. But you can't run under the Democratic Party without signing that contract. So I'm assuming that she did. She basically said, fuck it. I'm going to go and follow what my... Uh, what my heart says, and um, endorse Bernie Sanders. Now, she's the only one that did that. Tulsi Gabbard didn't do that. Andrew Yang didn't do that. Uh, none of them did it. Um, none of them came out and, and stood by their principles rather than a contractual, ob uh, uh, con contractual agreement um, to the uh, corporate wing of the left, the corporate wing of the liberals, essentially. And that's what the Democratic Party is. And that's what the DNC is. The DNC is a private corporation um, that runs the election. The DNC and the RNC are both private corporations that run our elections. Uh, the, the convention is basically a corporate scam, um, essentially. And, and, that, and that's, you know, that's where our electoral system is. So, you know, that's something to consider in all of this. Do we want to continue supporting a system like this? Um, you know, because that's where the conversation is going. What the fuck do we do, right? Now, what's interesting to me is there's a lot of people uh, that got on everybody's case, right? They got on all the Bernie Sanders people's case of like, well, you got to vote for Joe Biden. You have to vote for Joe Biden. Um, and uh, my very quick response to that is, uh, no, we fucking don't. Who says we have to vote for this person? Do you not understand how a democracy works, where we have choices in who we should vote for? Um, and not all Democrats are monoliths. And I don't, I'm not even a Democrat. Like, I don't consider myself to be a Democrat. Um, I think I might have considered myself to be a Democrat maybe in, like, 99, 2000. Um, you know, and I was in this country for four years. I was 12 or 13 at that point. And at that point, uh, as a child, I might have considered myself to be a Democrat. Uh, after 2001, I kind of really didn't know where I fit in. It seemed like the Democrats were, were nicer than the Republicans. Um, and then as I grew older, the further and further away from being an actual Democrat I became, especially after 9-11, especially after 9-11, and especially after the Obama administration, too. I think... I think the Obama administration sealed the deal on the fact that I wasn't going to be a Democrat um, because Obama really didn't stand for hope and change. He wasn't really the, the um, you know, for, for lack of a better uh, term here, the maverick candidate that he that everybody envisioned him to be. Right. Um, he didn't cut through racial barriers. Um, he kind of towed the line of the corporate establishment. He his cabinet was picked by Citibank. Uh, he let the fossil fuel industry basically do whatever they want while, you know, going on a public level. And, um, 
and saying some nice platitudes about how we need to protect the earth and climate change and climate change and whatever. Uh, you know, he it, it deported the most amount of immigrants, created ICE, which is clearly a problem, which, which is which is escalated the immigration problem and the xenophobia and the racism that that was already existent at that time. You know, um, just because Obama uh, became the president didn't mean that racism was over, that we had solved all the problems from the civil rights era, that we had taken care of workers issues, that, you know, we were going to start teaching about the Black Panthers on an accurate level in high schools. We weren't going to we weren't doing any of that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I, I got to I got to say I, I wasn't particularly Democrat. And when. Um, when I uh, saw that Bernie was going to run for uh, president under the Democratic ticket, I kind of had a little bit of hope uh, for the transformation of the Democratic Party. And that kind of failed in 2016. And then we arrived at Tulsi Gabbard and Andrew Yang and Bernie Sanders all on the same stage. And I was like, holy shit, this might be something. We might actually be able to pull this whole internal transformation uh, of the Democratic Party, we, we might be able to pull that off, right? We might actually be able to do this. And um, and then it became more and more evident uh, within the last three months that that was not going to happen. Um, you had first Andrew Yang endorsing Joe Biden, uh, which made no logical sense other than, you know, that he said he was going to, whatever. Um, and, you know, if that's what we're going by, then, you know, Hillary Clinton has said some things that she was going to do and then she never fucking did it. Uh, Obama said he was going to do some things and then he never fucking did it. This whole he said he was going to do it is not a viable enough of an argument where if you're going to stand by your principles, then fucking stand by your principles. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, same thing. She endorsed Joe Biden. You know, there was a Jimmy Dore interview um, and I watched that interview and, you know, um, I, I still think um, the value of these candidates uh, that uh, ran in the race was important. Uh, you did have Andrew Yang bringing universal basic income, even though it was sort of this very rudimentary version, this very compromised version of universal basic income. But we were still talking about it, uh, something that when I brought it up almost five years ago, um, you know, there were some people on my side, but then there were a lot of other people that were kind of, you know, shitting on me for, for bringing something up. And I would get the typical arguments of laziness and hand, handouts and, you know, uh, you're communist and all this other shit. Uh, same thing with Tulsi Gabbard, but having the anti-war voice, uh, having somebody that was holding the DNC accountable for what they were doing. All these were kind of important things. And then you had Bernie Sanders, who was kind of who, who kind of inspired these movements um, by by being the person that was consistent for 40 years. Um, and look, those are all credits that I don't think we're going to take away. But, you know, what I've come to realize over the years, and this is something that I know a lot of other progressive commentators have also said, Ron Placone, Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore, Katie Halper. You know, I, I look at these guys as mascots for what the movement is. That's really what they are. Um, they're, they're not the movement. We are the movement. Um, if it's really not me, us, then, then let's, let's make it about us now, you know. Um, so, so now it's, it's, it's come down to um, the people that supported Bernie and Tulsi and Andrew. There's a Andrew Yang. There's, there's a... Um, uh, a good portion of us that are thinking for ourselves and saying, well, we need to find something different. Um, you know, the, when Andrew Yang endorsed Joe Biden, there was a percentage that were like, okay, well, we'll go to Tulsi or Bernie. And then when Tulsi did the same thing, there was a bunch of us that went, I guess Bernie's all we have left. And, and then when, you know, when Bernie suspended his campaign, we were then just in the waiting room. We were in the waiting room for this endorsement. Um, and when it arrived, now the now the question comes up to exactly what I said before, which is, you know, we carry the movement forward. There's already um, a couple different things of this whole dem exit kind of thing of of creating a party that's specifically meant for the people, creating a restructuring of 
um, you know, just the government itself and is how is that going to be achieved? And perhaps it's going to be achieved with a, you know, this sort of a national general strike idea, um, you know, bringing the people into um, into the negotiating room um, and, and really legislating and making laws that uh, uh that make more sense for for the the livelihood and the and the willingness of people than it does for um you know uh, corporate interests moneyed interests for uh, you know the the upper class the billionaires which is which they've been getting tax cuts and handouts from the government for 200 plus years um and uh you know i i think uh I think that's and and this is kind of what we're fighting for, right? So that movement still goes on. There's still third party options. There's a lot of different options where we don't have to co-opt into this two party system. And there are still people, intelligent people that I'm friends with that that you know and it and it saddens me to some degree um that I see these intelligent people that are on the pulse of everything that 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 are that are willing to have um you know open uh, heartfelt, compassionate, intellectual uh, discussions that want me to vote for Joe Biden, um, and they want me to vote for Joe Biden because he's a, he's not Trump, right? Uh, which is false because I think they're not very different. I, I they're virtually the same. I there might be me, a little one percent difference, um, and I will get into that in a moment because I know I've talked about this. Um, possibly at nauseum. I understand that. Um, I do understand that I know I've, I've made these arguments before, and I know I'm not going to convince all of you uh, to view this, but, but I'm still going to encourage, um, you know, some critical thought. Some, um, let's move beyond the, uh, the, the letter of the party. Let, let's, let's move beyond, you know, uh, well, he's not this other guy. Those, those are not, those aren't arguments to be made about why you should vote for somebody. You should want to vote for somebody because you're excited to vote for them, because their ideals um, either exactly match up to, or almost always, uh, you know, almost all of them match up to what what you want. You you think that they are the right direction that the country needs to go in, not some status quo bullshit that are, you know, so it's like, why, why are we going back to the exact thing that brought us here in the first place? What logical decision, what logical sense does that make? It kind of doesn't. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I am going to tell you to think critically and take all of the, take all of the information and all of the facts into account other than, well, we got to get rid of Trump. Sure, I'm not. I don't like Trump either. I think Trump is essentially the, the, you know, the living and embodiment of what this system is. This corrupt, lying, egotistical, narcissistic, rugged individualism, failing, rotting system. Have I gotten it through? Do you guys, do you guys get how I don't like with the fucking system in place? And Joe Biden is is basically. Um, basically the same thing. He's the representation of the exact same system. It's just he has a different letter by his name. You know, his liver spots are in a different place in his head. He has a different hairstyle. That's it. So the superficiality of things is different. That's the the 1% of difference between Trump and Biden. So, you know, so people come up to me and they go, well, well, um, Chris, don't vote for Biden. Vote for the Supreme Court justice that he's going to have to put in place. Vote for that Supreme Court justice. Sure, okay. If that's what we're voting for, what are, what is the likelihood that Joe Biden is actually going to uh, put in a progressive Supreme Court judge that is on the side of the worker, that is on the side of human rights, um, that probably understands that a 200-year-old document, um, you know, that has a couple of amendments to it isn't particularly, like, maybe that's not the best way to, to run a country that's constantly changing and evolving, that's, that has made a lot of social strides in the last two decades alone. Um, perhaps there's going to be some discrepancies. Perhaps the language in which it's written is not particularly great, and maybe we need to reevaluate that. 
maybe we need to go by the judgment of the times rather than the judgment of somebody that wrote it 200 years ago, hoping that it would last for as long as it did. Um, I, you know, even one of the founding fathers was like, yeah, we should probably have a revolution every 20 years and we should probably change this thing up every 20 years. This should be an evolving document and adding an amendment is not, that's not the only thing that's, that makes it an evolving document. Now, I, I you know, open to interpretation, that's fine. I, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of flack and feedback uh, from a lot of people of saying like, you can't fucking touch that concept. I mean, it's, it's a sacred document. Would you want to change the Bible? Yeah, we have, we have changed the Bible. That's like the most sacred document in America, the Christian nation, isn't it? The most sacred document ever has been fucked with and changed and reinterpreted 150,000 times. The, the shade of alabaster white that Jesus is portrayed in has changed. He goes from alabaster to eggshell white, and then he goes to neutral white to milk white. That has changed 100,000 times. And you're telling me that you can't look at the Constitution that was written in the language of 1776 and go, maybe they didn't have all this right. Maybe this language needs to be tweaked up a little bit. One of the founding fathers even said that's what we need to fucking do. Anyway, so we won't actually get a progressive in the court. I think what we'll get is a neoliberal judge. Because even Merrick Garland, the judge that Obama wanted to appoint, that gentleman, 93%, 93% in line with Brett Kavanaugh. So, you know, are we going to get a progressive judge? So Roe v. Wade comes up. So what? We're going we're gonna to either go to um, an authoritarian limit on uh, the subject of abortion um, and open up a Pandora's box to become, you know, to, to uh, renegotiate and reconvene on all of these other uh, uh, Supreme Court cases that um, have granted specific civil rights and human rights. Um, to, you know, overreach and create an authoritarian jurisdiction on those. Um, or we go, well, we're not going to say whether it's illegal or illegal, but we're going to leave it up to the states. Yeah, and that worked out really great. You want to go ask people in Georgia or Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Missouri. I mean, the list goes on. Do you want to go ask those people how that worked out? So, you know, the, the problem is not the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court wasn't even meant to have this much power to begin with either. Um, so maybe that's another point of discussion. But that's, I mean, that, you know, that's not a viable enough argument. If we're talking about progressive judges that are going to go up against these neocon, neoliberal judges, how many people want to overturn Citizens United other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg right now? And I'm not even sure if she does anymore. Um, the last time I checked, I know she did. There was probably a couple of justices that did. If you know how many justices did go want to go against something like Citizens United, um, leave a comment because I'm I'm um, failing to remember this information right now. <laughs> so uh, forgive my humanity in, in this uh, situation. But if you know the information, leave a comment. Leave a comment, and I will. Um, you know, I'll take a look at it, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to it, and, you know, I think we'll all kind of be better for it. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and maybe one or two other people, um, you know, that were, that were um, the lefty judges voted against something like Citizens United. So I don't know if the judges thing is a viable argument. Uh, so let's go down the rest of the list. Cognitive decline. I mean, this guy, that has been on everybody's lips since the first fucking debate. I mean, he got hammered and everybody was like, oh, maybe he just didn't expect to be hammered as much as he... And then it was like the next debate was just like he's stumbling and eking his way by through every response that he could possibly give. He can't finish a sentence. He's talking about corn pop and record players and rubbing kids rubbing his fucking hair and living with cotton. It's just like, what are you saying? What do you say? Create a narrative in your head, Joe. Be able to form a full concrete thought. I don't think he's cognitive to doing well. I'm not trying to make fun of him. I'm just trying to point out something that is a reality that we need to face. Don't you think that, that 
if 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 he's going to be the leader of the free world, that he should have some functioning level of cognition. I'm bringing that at the at the very top, at the very top, because that's something that no corporate media, no mainstream pundit, or any journalist, or anybody from his fucking campaign will actually address with anybody. They actually won't talk about it at all. In fact, that's actually one of the things they said, is after a while, uh, I think when it, in like December or something, they basically stopped talking about his cognitive functions. And then if you did bring up his cognitive function, you, you're, you know, oh, you're just trying to get Trump to win. Oh, you're just a, a Putin puppet. You're a, a Russian agent. Some McCarthy is bullshit will happen. Right? Now, Trump is also uh, in cognitive decline. The only difference is, uh, and Matt Taibbi brought this up. Fantastic journalist, by the way. You should, everybody should check out Matt Taibbi. He brought this up when he was on Joe Rogan's podcast uh, back in November. Is There's a very good chance that Trump is on speed. Right? Like, he takes these diet pills. Um, and, and that's just speed... Uh, and you know, that's, that's to kind of like amp you up and, and it makes you more, it gives you like a better stream of consciousness. And I've, I've never done speed. I don't fucking know what it actually does to you or, or, or anything like that. But you know, um, it's supposed to help improve that, the, the, the lack in cognition, but I'm sure it's also killing him on the inside. So there's also that if, if, if the DNC gave Joe Biden speed, I think he would be dead. Moving on, uh, no Medicare for all. That was something that Biden said that he was not going to do. Um, he even said it if Medicare for all came to me as a bill uh, that was supported by all the people in his party, uh, he'd veto it as president. In the middle of a fucking pandemic, he says this. In the middle, when, when hospitals are stressed out, when the, when the profit-driven uh, healthcare system isn't able to actually do anything to help its citizens, he says this. When everybody's asking for a way to, um, you know, financially help uh, each other and Medicare for all would be a way that it to, to, to help everybody that is in need during a global pandemic, he goes, no, we have to let the insurance companies make money. In an emergency situation where... The profit-driven insurance companies and healthcare model has failed society. He is unwilling to try something different. He has abysmal foreign policies. Abysmal foreign policies. Uh, he voted for the Iraq War, and when he was challenged by the U.S. weapons inspector Scott Ritter, he talked down to him. He condescended him. He treated him like shit. Uh, called him Scotty Boy basically said that he doesn't get to make these sort of calls because he doesn't get the big bucks. That's literally what he said to him in the meeting. There's, there's an interview with Scott Ritter um, that Aaron Maté, another fantastic journalist at the Gray Zone, uh, uh, did with, with Scott Ritter talking about what he found in Iraq and basically saying, like, hey, this isn't, like, you guys can't force this stuff on them. Um, they're, you know, and, and we didn't really find anything. Um, and he basically talked down to them. And he said, oh, so you want the control, Scotty. You want the control. You don't make the big bucks. So basically, to Joe Biden, if you don't have money, you don't have any status. You don't get to make any decisions. You don't get to um, have rights. You don't get to have your opinion valued. You don't get to make an opinion, period, because you, you, are, you are not monetarily wealthy. What he wants you to do is if you're not monetarily wealthy... Uh, is be subservient to those that are, which is um, an oligarchy. It's a plutocracy. Plus, he was part of uh, Obama's increased uh, drone warfares and extending all the wars in the Middle East. So we went from two to seven under the Obama administration, and Joe Biden was part of that administration. Joe Biden was part of the administration that increased all these wars. Um, you know, so Joe Biden is not a fan of peace. Uh, he definitely profits from. Um, from war, just like, you know, virtually, virtually every other member of Congress. This is an economy that's run by war. So, of course, they support it. Here's another thing. This, this kind of goes into why uh, Biden has the attitude that he does 
is uh, the last coherent thing he said, and this was the very beginning of his campaign. I, I don't know if people still remember this or not, but I sure as fuck do. Um, he said that he doesn't have any empathy for millennials. He doesn't have any empathy for us. Hey, oh, you're, you're struggling. You got all this debt. Yeah, you know, because we fucked over uh, the working class people by deregulating the banks and deregulating the pharmaceutical companies and deregulating insurance companies, letting them control and do whatever they wanted and fuck over the American people by shoveling more of the money up at the top. And we continue to bail out the banks. We continue to bail out the financial industries. We continue to bail out the insurance companies and the, and the big corporate conglomerates and let people have monopolies fucking over the America. But that's on. That's your fault. That's your fault. I have no empathy. You should have done something different. And this, and this is how he's continued to behave throughout the campaign. There, there, are, um, there are activists that have come up to him. Uh, there have been journalists that have, been come, up, kind of, that have come up to him. Uh, there was one journalist where uh, he, he said, Hey, so Bernie Sanders is talking about Medicare for All and seems very popular. Um, why won't you consider? And he goes, why, 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 like, I, like, uh, and the journalist is like, what's happening right now? What is this? There was a fossil fuel activist that literally said, what are we going to do about these pipelines? And he was like, yeah, we got to do something about them. And he goes, yeah, so, so w what are we going to do? Like, what are you going to do if you're president about these pipelines? Will you restrict these pipelines from being built? you know, on native ground over, over, uh, water, uh, resources and uh, over people's homes. Are you going to stop the poisoning of, uh, of American communities because of pipe? And he goes, Hey, I'm not your guy. You should vote for somebody else. Like he literally said that to somebody. And we'll conclude with this, <laughs> uh, the sexual assault of Tara Reed. Um, Tara Reed originally went on Katie Halpert's podcast and told the story of how Joe Biden sexually assaulted her. I'm not going to uh, go go into that that story. I, I do recommend that you guys go check it out. And then she and then, um, you know, she was on uh, Rising. Um, Hill TV, Crystal and Sagar and Jetty. Uh, great program. I enjoy it. Uh, you know, I, I don't agree with them all the time, but I like the coverage that they do They're there and, and the way that they cover it. They're very thorough. And they let Tara talk. Um, and she points out, uh, you know, some of the horrible things that Joe Biden uh, said to her as he was sexually assaulting her. Like, oh, I thought you liked me. Um, and then when she resisted and, and, you know, eventually got him off, he said that she was nothing to him. This is Joe Biden. 100% through and through. This is who he is. And it explains his attitude towards Anita Hill. Because to Joe Biden, if you're in a position of power, um, any behavior of ill repute is, uh, is fine. The aggression, the condescension, all of that makes sense if you look at it through that lens. If you believe that you're in a position of power and you can do and get away with whatever the fuck you want. Of course you're going to treat Anita Hill the way that you did. Of course you're not going to apologize to her. Now Joe Biden hasn't said a goddamn word about it. And I'm sure he has a team of lawyers that are like, shut the fuck. Dude, you can't make a sentence come out of your mouth that makes any sense. Do you really think an apology on an issue this big is going to even make sense. Like, and then you have fake, fake fucking progressive psychologists like in Milano that completely ignore Tara Reid, but they do come after Brett Kavanaugh. So where, where is she on that Me Too movement? You know, so, so that's a fake progressive right there. And these are the greatest hits. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I'm missing. The segregationist stuff, he, was, he, he supported segregationists in the, during the civil rights movement. He's never been on the side of the worker. I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of stuff. That'll be a fun comment section to see is how many people come up with other shit that Joe Biden has done that I didn't talk about. I just, I just, I just made the greatest hits. These are just the greatest hits. Uh, things that I think need to be talked about pretty consistently. Because here's the thing. 
uh, Trump is also convicted um, uh, or, or been accused of sexual assault several times by many people, right? And I'm sure uh, there were seven women that, that came out and said that Joe Biden made them feel very uncomfortable because he got way too close and lingered on a hug and he holds children and sniffs them. Um, very regret, like it's creepy to watch those videos. Um, Trump does the same thing. Trump also not a big fan of Medicare for all, but he's implementing his own version of it. Like the CARES Act is essentially like, hey, if you've been, if you think you have COVID, just go to the hospital. And if you, even if you don't have insurance, just fucking go and get it checked out and tell them, you know, CARES Act and, and it, the hospital will be billed under, uh, you know, Medicare or whatever. And, you know, Trump even came out and he wasn't really for war. Now he's escalating things by putting sanctions on Iran and by illegally killing the, uh, you know, one of the premier leaders of Iran, General Qassem uh, Soleimani, uh, who was on a peace mission when uh, Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump uh, illegally assassinated this world leader, <laughs> along with, uh, you know, uh, uh, high officials in, of the Iraqi government as well. So, you know, where are we at? How are these two people different? After everything I've just pointed out, how are they different? I don't really see that much of a difference. Um, I made a joke today on on the on the Twitters, uh, and I've been joking, you know, back and forth with the, with a couple of my friends about this as well. Is um, I don't, on, to be honest with you, I don't know what I'm going to do in November. I I, I really don't have um, an answer. For you guys, I probably won't until I get into that voting booth. Um, you know, I've never had an opportunity to vote. And uh, guess what? Not particularly excited about it. Not fucking psyched. Like zero psych about this at all. Yeah. Like I don't, I'm, I'm not excited. Americans can sit there and be like, well, we all hold our nose and, and vote. Well, great, but I'm an immigrant. I've lived here for 22 years um, by just, you know, having you guys holding your nose and voting and the country going to shit. So if we're going to vote, I kind of take that shit a little bit more seriously because I haven't had the opportunity to for 22 years. But they've had the opportunity to make laws and legislation uh, not on my behalf, completely fuck me over and me not being represented because I can't I can't be that representation for myself. So I depended on you guys. And as far as I see it, um, you know, the left has failed the, or the liberals, whatever, have, have failed, you know, people like me. And now that I have the opportunity to vote, I take that shit very seriously. Um, so, no, I'm not interested in holding my nose and voting for somebody that I don't give a shit about. This is a serious thing. So I've been, being that it's serious, of course, me been joking around is, um, you know, to do a writing campaign. Um, I'm there's a restaurant in, uh, I believe Norfolk, Lo Portsmouth, Portsmouth, Virginia, near near Norfolk, Virginia, called Longboards, fantastic restaurant. And uh, when I was there in January, um, Jason and Jesse, two very good friends of mine from Lorry Creek, a uh, great band, you should check out. Uh, took me to Longboards after the show, and we were hanging out, having a couple beers, and um, I had these uh, boneless chicken tenders and this, like, spicy sauce. It was incredible. Um, I might write that in uh, instead of Joe Biden. Or I might write in Eugene Debs. Both of those options. Um, a person that has been dead for nearly a century... Um, and very delicious chicken tenders from a amazing restaurant in Portsmouth, Virginia, both have more cognitive ability and have been less rude to the American people uh, than Joe Biden has been in the last 40 fucking years. Cheers.
Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day, so make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and um, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.